Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Torah portion this morning. I'm so glad to have you on with us. And uh, today we are exploring the Torah portion, Ekev. Uh, before we get further into today's uh, session, which has only been a minute so far, um, I would just like to thank Pastor Greg, uh, my dad, for allowing me to teach today's lesson. Uh, it's a, such a wonderful privilege to be able to teach the Word of God and, uh, and, and do so in such a forum. So thank you to Pastor Greg for this opportunity and also to everyone who's joining with us today. Uh, before we begin the portion, I might just ask Peter, would you uh, please be able to pray to kick us off this morning? Certainly. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for who you are. Thank you for the time we have on this Sabbath to rest, to learn about you and to be able to join with other believers. And we just uh, pray that this time would be um, encouraging for us, challenging if need be, and you would do a work in each of our hearts. Give uh, Pastor Kyle wisdom as he shares your word in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Peter. All right, so uh, the the title of this portion is called Ekev, and Ekev has a couple of meanings. That root word of Ekev can mean consequence, it can also mean because, and it can also mean heal, so as in heal as in the foot. And so we're going to have a little look at what, what some of that means in a moment. But to kick us off, we're going to look at Deuteronomy 7. So everyone grab your Bibles and open to Deuteronomy 7, 12. And as you're getting to Deuteronomy 7, 12. I'm going to ask if Cam could lead us this morning in reading Deuteronomy 7 verses 12 through to 26. Deuteronomy 7, 12 to 26. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> then it shall come to pass because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers, and he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness, and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but will lay them on all those who hate you. Also, you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your, Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eyes shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. It, uh, if you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than, than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So, so shall the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among you, sorry, among them until those who are left who hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be terrified of them for the Lord, your God, the great and awesome God is among you. And the Lord, your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But the Lord, your God will deliver them over to you and you, sorry, and will, and will inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. And he will deliver their kings into your hand, and you will destroy their name from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. You shall turn, sorry, you shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it. For it, it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor, abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. Thank you very much, Cam, for reading that. Cam's an elder at Kingdom Church, and just want to thank you for reading that, Cam. Um, so this portion, at least in this first segment that Cam just read out, 
There's an incredible amount to unpack. We've got themes of faith. We've got themes of healing. We've got themes of idol worship. We've got some insects that are going to apparently go and strike the Canaanites. Who are the Canaanites? And so today we're going to just have a look at this and unpack it as we go. And if you've got any questions, please uh, just uh, put your use the reaction button to put your hand up. Uh, it should be down the bottom of your screen. You can use that and I'll do my very best to answer the questions or at least some of the wonderful teachers like Michelle, uh, Kelly, Pastor Lynn. Uh, I know Peter and a few, even Abby's on as well. Jay's on. Some of our teachers of the Torah portion will be able to respond uh, to your questions if I don't know the answer or if I'm struggling with the answer. So let's go to verse 12. And I might get a couple of people to help me just getting some reading done. Leanne, would you mind uh, grabbing Matthew 5.19, please? Matthew 5.19. Uh, John, would you mind grabbing uh, Matthew 6.26, please? And I'm going to ask Pastor Lynn if you could grab, please, Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. So Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 4, please. All right. So while you're getting there, um, in verse 12 of Deuteronomy 7, it says this, And it will be because you will heed these ordinances or these commands of the Lord, and keep them and perform them that the Lord your God will keep for you the covenant and the kindness that he swore to your forefathers. So Rashi, who's a rabbi, he makes a comment on this and he says, because you will heed refers to even keeping the smallest commandments. Can anyone tell me today what you think one of the smallest commandments of the Bible might be? Yes, Abby. Uh, not to take a mother bird from its nest while, no, not to take the children from the mother bird's nest while the mother bird is present. Fantastic. And why why would that be a command? Why do you think that's a command that the Lord thinks is important? Uh, follows almost a for the least of these um, type thing, but it beyond that, it's almost as if if you're going to show um, respect and dignity for this little tiny bird animal, um, how much more so um, will you do so for your brother who is a human? Um, how much more are you going to give them that dignity and respect um, in that way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Spot on, Abby. So if you can do it for a a mother bird and it's young, so you'll be able to be do it to your brothers and sisters. Uh, Leanne, just off that note, uh, are, you in a, are you able to read Matthew 5.19? Yes, I can. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Absolutely. So here we have Jesus teaching about even the least of the commandments and how important they are. And I just wonder in the world today, you might agree with me on this, but uh, do we see a disregard of the commands, especially relating to what might be considered the least of things, nature? Uh, you know, that we, we don't often see the mother bird being put away from her eggs. We don't. Would you would you agree that we see um, a general distaste or a uh, a minimalizing of treatment towards even nature. Would you agree that you see that around the world? Uh, in a large way today, we see a sort of a disregard for nature. People litter, people get rid of things. They, 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 they don't take care of the world around them. Um, by the way, I'm not coming from a Greens political perspective today. Today, I'm just speaking from the scripture. Uh, but the command here on the least of these that Abby mentioned comes from Deuteronomy 22.6. And it says, and it is considered the least command that you might remove if you were to have to go and collect birds or young or eggs from a nest that you'd first remove the mother bird. It's a kindness to the mother bird. And it also means that you preserve that mother bird to be able to have further young in the future. And so it doesn't it doesn't seem like a big thing, but it does carry a consequence. Does anyone know what the consequence of obeying this little command is? Have a shot at it. There's a couple of commands that come with a promise. Who knows what that one might be? Go for it, Scott. It says at the end of the next little verse that you will have a long life if you obey that one. 
Fantastic. That's right. So if you obey the least command in the Bible, out of all of the commands, possibly the 613 that are found in the Torah, plus the 200 plus that are found in the New Testament given by Jesus and the apostles, if you were to obey the least commandment that you find in the scripture, you will have a long life if you can simply remove the eggs from uh, the, the mother as she's, as she's laying them. That, by the way, folks, has made me start to rethink caged eggs for myself. I know this is, I'm just probably, you know, you might not give too much thought to this, but it has made me personally rethink how I go and I buy, sh buy things from the shop. Am I fulfilling the command of God if I buy things where the mother is attached still to her nest? And so there's, there's just something to consider in achieving the smallest of the command we're achieving and fulfilling the commands of God get God cares about these small things and he asks us to care about the small things as well John could you please read Matthew 6 26 look at the birds of the air they do not sow or reap or store away in their barns yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not much more valuable than they Thank you, John. So God cares for, uh, God loves it when we care for his creation. In fact, it says that he, he feeds the sparrows and he feeds these birds, which means that we should have a regard for his creation as well. I know sometimes even though we view, God views us as more valuable than the sparrows, we sometimes view ourselves as more value or more dominant or uh, more domineering than a lot of God's creation. But God simply asks us to keep in mind and consider his creation in a beautiful way. Why? For if for no other reason that it is God's creation also. Um, God God loves it. So he prescribes a, a manner of sowing and reaping. He, he pr prescribes times of rest for the land. This is all found in his Torah. He prescribes perfect time and care of detail. Lynn, would you please read us Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 to 4? Yeah. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Fantastic. So God appoints a time for everything. Thank you, Pastor Lynn, for that. God appoints a time for everything, a place for everything, a purpose for everything, which means even down to the smallest level, God cares about his creatures in creation. And so here in this portion, we're going to read uh, that even if we tread on those small things, we're breaking the commands of God. This is why I'm starting off at this point. The word at Kev, as I mentioned, means heal or because or consequence. And it's in the sense we get with the word Ekev is to tread lightly, be careful. When we're around the commands of God, let us not forsake the, uh, the small commands in wanting to keep the larger ones. Uh, so God appoints times and the promise that comes from this is that we might live long, or at least to the people of Israel, that they might live long in the la land. And it's important for us to keep that command. Rashi also says that the Lord your God will keep means that he will then keep his promise to you. So when you start to think about even animals and how God cares for them and how we're not to take advantage of the, of animals in that way, we're not, you know, we're, we're to, if, you, if we're to gather eggs that we were to let the mother bird go, think about commands like that, like ways, ways that you could uh, be involved in preserving and honoring nature in some way. Uh, that's what God cares about. And it comes with us living a long life. We as believers in the kingdom aren't people who litter. Gee, I, 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 um, I, I'm interested in how this is sounding to each of you because this probably sounds like a climate preservation uh, you know, seminar. This is, not, this is probably not the angle I'm going for, but what I am going for is how God cares about the world that he created just as much as he cares about you and I. We aren't people who kill things needlessly. Uh, there was a group of people, but boys in New South Wales, they had shot and killed a kangaroo and they put him on the corner of a road uh, in a camp chair and dressed him up in, a, in an Aussie shirt and a, a, as a bit of a laughing stock. That's terrible. That kind of thing, that kind of thing does no good. That's not uh, caring for God's creation. That's making a mockery of God's creation. And so we don't 
treat animals with contempt. We honor them. We recognize that every object, even if it's seemingly null and void of life, like rocks, God has a function and a purpose for it. And therefore, it still carries his breath and still carries his DNA and therefore deserves to be treated as he describes. So when we're next looking at the world around us, I want you to consider how would God like me to treat what's in front of me? Do I simply disregard things? Do I simply treat things easily and lightly? Or do I treat things as the creator himself would with love, care and respect? Everyone okay so far? Fantastic. All right, let's let's get on to obedience. Obedience is the next part. So that's the least of the command. In the next part, we find that obedience begets the blessing of God. Deuteronomy 7.13 says this, He will love you, He will bless you, He will multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your soil, the fruit of your grain, your wine, your oil, the offspring of your cattle, and the choice of your flocks, in the land which He swore to your forefathers to give you. And then in verse 14 it says, You will be blessed among above all the peoples, there will be no sterile or barren among you or your livestock. So this portion introduces to us this thing called, and I call it the great Torah cycle. And the great Torah cycle goes something like this. The Torah brings success to our lives. When we start to follow God's ways, we start to find that we're put on a path towards success and blessing. But along the way, with the success that we find in our life, whether it's God blessing us financially or we start to have family, Whatever it is, we start to then experience complacency in that moment. Success leads to complacency. Complacency leads to a neglect of the Torah. The neglect of Torah then leads to failure. And this cycle can then restart, but the restart required requires repentance that we come back to the Torah. So everyone okay with that cycle? We've got the Torah brings success. But what often happens is when success is found, it leads to complacency, which leads to neglect, which leads to failure. Is that observable in our nation today? Do we see that around the world where our nations have been founded on Judeo-Christian values and there's been incredible success, incredible wealth, prosperity, blessing? And yet now we find that because of the success and complacency, there is now a neglect and disregard for the Torah. It's probably something worth evaluating in our lives is, is when we don't like reading the Word of God or when we don't like opening the Bible, we need to really evaluate how uh, far we are in the cycle and where we are in that cycle of the Torah. Any questions so far? If you've got a question, just don't forget you can shoot your reaction button up at any time and uh, and we can have it have a talk. So why does God require repentance then? Why does he require us to not only obey the least of the commands, but to, to repent? Well, the, the word for repent in Hebrew is shuva or teshuva, which means to return. Uh, it, it actually means not just to return, but to turn around. And if the word Torah means to hit the mark and the word sin, chata, means to miss the mark, then the word shuva or tushuva means to return to that path. It, it's the action of bringing us back to that path. The Torah is pointing us in the right direction. Shuva and tushuva is bringing us back when we go off on those small deviations. Like an orient, uh, a person who's orienteering or he's got his compass out, he only needs to be one degree off to miss the mark. And what returns him to that path is a recognition that he's off track and then a, and a purpose decision to move back to the mark that's going to lead to the right place. Rashi then comments and he says, the offspring of your cattle that are mentioned here, the offspring of your, uh, the, you know, the, the fruit of the land and the, and the choice olives and the choice stock. When you obey the commands of the, God, of the Lord God, the covenant promise is that you will not lack in every, anything. The choice of the cattle, Rashi says, are the absolute cattle that will bless you. The choice of the livestock and, and, and chickens and all, they're the things that are going to bless you. If someone has chickens that lay eggs this big, the choice chickens that you will have as part of the covenant will lay eggs this big. It's like the golden goose, you know. You will be blessed as you walk in the covenant by unexpected, unmerited, but wonderful favor of the Lord. If you position yourself to stand within the bounds of his commands, he will bless you. Uh, it also says that you will have the choice of the olive oil and, and all of these wonderful. Doesn't it sound nice? 
doesn't isn't that language the choice of everything sound so nice this is probably slightly different to a prosperity kind of gospel but this is the language that is used by god the father that says when you walk within the bounds of obedience this is what you will receive so much so that he promises that there shall be no sterile among you not even your livestock not even your uh, men or women and this is one of the things that I like to stand upon because we in the past have had people we've been involved involved with who have not been able to have children. And even presently, there might be people today who cannot have children. But I want to tell you that the command of the Lord says that as we are obedient to his commands, he is the one that will overcome any physical issues. There shall be no sterile or barren among us. This is the Lord's promise to us. Whether this relates to physical children, livestock, animals, or even our own spiritual lives, there will be no sterile among you. If you're looking at how to make disciples, consider for a moment that as you start to align your life with the commands of God, there will be no sterile among you. You will produce good fruit. According to the rabbis and scriptures, when we walk in obedience to God, the blessing that comes is not just addition, but it's multiplication. Obedience begets multiplication. Discipline begets multiplication. Everything that brings enrichment in life, everything that we do in obedience to him, he causes multiplication. This is what the scriptures are saying. So if we want a multiplied life, an effective, fruitful life, the answer is really simple. It probably just rolls off the tongue, but we need to be obedient to the commands of the Lord. There are promises that we can lay a hold of in this passage that do apply to Gentiles as well. And God's promise here is for those who obey God's his righteous commands that there is life av available in areas that seem dead or even broken. God's pe uh, God, God listens to his people when we obey him. God shamars his people when we shamar him. Have you, have you heard that word over the last couple of weeks, the word shamar, listen and do or listen and obey? When we cry out to God, he listens and he acts, but then it requires us to listen and then act. We're required to respond. To become people, uh, he, he also calls us as people to guard his commands. So we're not required just to fulfill the commands, we're required to guard them as well. So in guarding them, we become people who teach others. That's how we guard. We teach others the command, we show others to live. And collectively, we become a community that obeys God's commands together. Just out of interest, who on the on the Torah portion has found it a an easier journey to obey some of God's commands when we do it all together? You've, you've found that? Who found it difficult, maybe at the beginning, to implement a command that nobody else seemed to be observing? Did anyone else find that? At the start, you see, it feels a bit awkward. When you, who's got an example of that? Who might have an example of a command that they found in the scripture that they've implemented and at the start it felt difficult? Maybe like no one supported. John, please, I can see some hands, but please make sure you use your reactions just so it pops up to the top of my screen. Thanks, John. My hardest one was obeying the Sabbath. Do not do any work on the Sabbath. That's not me. <laughs> no, you just can't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely john it's one of the hard things isn't it we 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 in our nature want to do stuff and i know like having a workshop like yours on the back of your place you might be tempted john to just go and create a bunch of things build a bunch of wooden boxes or something like that you know it's just all there for you uh it, you know god put in us our creativity but he does want us to also have that sabbath day rest who else has an example of a, a command that might have been difficult to uh obey at the start because there weren't many people involved yes leon uh for me it was um regular prayer time which has now become a habit of mine wonderful wonderful i'm glad to hear that i was blessed by a couple of things that leon's told me this week uh one was that he, he and beth listened to rabbi gordon uh from the day from the chabad website and Rabbi Gordon, if you haven't already tuned into him, he's a Jewish man. He's not a Messianic believer, so he doesn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but he's a wonderful teacher of the Torah who believes in the Messiah. So he will one day, God willing, get this revelation that Jesus is the Messiah somehow. However, uh, he's been part of our, our drives in the car, and I'm sure he's been part of uh, Leon and Beth's home, but a wonderful teacher along the way. And I was also 
blessed to hear that you've you've implemented regular prayer, Leon. Yes, Leon. And in fact, I was just looking at my calendars, and we're I'm I'm about to hit two years with Rabbi Gordon every morning. That's wonderful, Leon. Absolutely wonderful. Congratulations. Who else has had a command that they've uh, struggled with or, or implemented and it was a bit lonely at the start? Or even one that's become easier because the community, collective community, friends around have also observed that command. What might be one of those for you? Uh, the festivals. Right, right. The festivals. Yes, absolutely. What about you, uh, Team Belshaw? Doing kosher meat. Yeah, unreal. And has that, have you guys, Chloe, have you found that that's been easier for you to do as a family as there have been more people in the community who've also done that? Uh, yes. Fantastic. And uh, Beth, you were going to say something there as well? Uh, Pastor Kyle, I think as a church, because we've worked through the higher sod studies, foundation, Sabbath and festivals, it's explained to us why we should be keeping these commandments. And for that reason, it has become easier because we know that it, they are commanded by God. Mm. Absolutely, Beth. That's, it's true. It's true. And sometimes that why is so important. And that is that he brings his blessing as we start to... Uh, learn this. Now, I'm going to expand upon some of the commands in just a little bit of a moment, but um, we're going to go to the next verse, which is verse 15 of Deuteronomy 7. And I'm just wondering if, June, would you be able to read, have you got your Bible, June? Have you got your, is that, are you able to read, June? Are you in a position to do that? Yes. Which verses? Deuteronomy 7, verses 15. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness. Is that the one? Yes, and, that's the and, one. And will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but will lay them on all those who hate you. All right. So thank you, June, for that. Let's talk about sickness for a moment and dealing with sickness. This is one of the uh, incredible instances where we see as part of obedience to the commands of the Lord that there'll be no barren, no sterile, uh, none of the diseases of Egypt and no sickness among us. How much sickness is the Lord going to remove according to this passage? I think I saw Michelle saying all, all, all. Yes, everybody's saying all. Does he mean part? Does he mean 30%? Does he mean only 20%? Does it mean when you get prayed for, he's only going to just remove slight part of the headache? Or No, he says all. So God's intention and desire is that when you are in line with his commands, when you're obedient to him, his covenant is that he removes all sickness. I want you to say all sickness. You don't have to unmute yourself, but just say all sickness. If anyone is sick in their body, I want you to just right now listen to what we're about to talk about and the scriptures we're about to uh, speak over ourselves, and we're going to see all sickness is God's intention to be. Uh, God intends all sickness to be removed from us. Jeremiah seventeen fourteen, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are the one I praise. Now that sounds like a very uh, matter of factish statement. You know, heal me, Lord, and I'll be healed. But the truth of the matter is, there's trust that God is going to heal. Abby, can I get you please to go to Exodus 23, 25? Can I please get, uh, can I please get Leon? Could you go to Isaiah 53, 4 to 5? Michelle, could you please go to Jeremiah 30, 17? And Kelly, could you please go to Matthew 4, 23 to 24? All right, let's just start. Uh, you got that one, Abby? All right, let's 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 read these. Uh, we'll just start with Abby and then Leon, you can go straight after Abby. Michelle, you can go straight after Leon and then Kelly, you can follow on. All right, go for it, Abby. 
Uh, Exodus 23, verse 25. You must serve only the Lord your God. If you do, I will bless you with food and water. I will protect you from illness. Fantastic. Surely he has borne our sicknesses, our pains. He's carried, carried them, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But, uh, but he was but he was wounded because of our transgressions, bruised, bruised because of our inequities, chased, oh goodness, and chastisement of our peace was upon him, and we have been healed by his wounds. Thank you, Leon. Okay, Jeremiah. 30, 17, for I will restore health to you and I will heal your wounds, says the Lord, because they have called you an outcast saying, this is Zion whom no one seeks after and for whom no one cares. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Matthew 4, 23 to 24. And he went through all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures, paralytics, and he healed them. Awesome. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for reading that. So just to clarify, after reading all of those passages, is there any confusion that God wants to eliminate all disease? God wants to eliminate all sickness and all disease from his people. Is that right? Is that what we're understanding? So is God's will that anybody is sick? Is it God's will that any person might have sickness in their body? No, it's not. Yes, Peter, you got a question. Yeah, I just had a question um, regarding when Jesus came into um, the pool of Bethesda. And uh, I thought maybe it might be good to talk about that because he didn't heal everyone in there but maybe the holy spirit just led him to that one paralytic whom he healed that day and it just maybe raised some questions for some people about why didn't he go in there and just heal everyone because if they were living in the in israel at that time surely they were his people as well maybe not keeping his commands but um it might be a point of discussion. It's a great, a wonderful question. And thank you, Peter, for raising that. I think it's worth us having a little bit of a conversation around sickness because uh, it, it would seem to some uh, who have the experience of ongoing and continual sickness that maybe this is God's punishment for me. Maybe I'm here because I've done something wrong. Maybe I'm maybe I'm living like this and, and I, I've got a generational curse. Uh, let, let's open it up. Let's talk about uh, sickness for a second and let's talk about healing. I, I noticed Pastor Enoch and Sarah are on the screen as well. Did you have something that you, you two might add to the conversation here? I guess for me, I'm finding that it's God's will to heal, but sometimes we hinder that. Um, and it's 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 yeah. not it's not, not just like a, with Jesus when he went to his hometown. Yeah, he, he couldn't, couldn't he couldn't heal many there because of their, you know, the way they perceived him. I guess is the best way of putting it because they knew him. They didn't believe that he could do it. Hmm. And I guess there's an element where, you know, I think the 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 people that really struggle are actually those that believe in God because um, someone who doesn't know God is just acting out of pure faith of that person's prayer that who's praying for them. Whereas us as believers, it takes, I don't know, sometimes months or years or days to get our heads around the fact that God can heal. And I, I think it's more of a struggle for us as believers who are actually struggling to believe, to see that God does want to heal and does want to see us set free. But for some reason, we allow our thinking to stop that. Um, and it's not necessarily that it's our fault, but it's just it's where it's where we're at, and God's got to take us on a journey of how to get there. I'm going to put myself on mute now. 
<laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Pastor Enoch. Um, it, it, great and valuable uh, points for this conversation as well about sickness. Um, you know, Jesus would have, as Peter mentioned, he, he would have gone down to the Pool of Siloam. He would have gone to the temple. Uh, you know, we know Peter, uh, James and uh, John prayed for a man and said, silver and gold, have I none? What I have, I give to you. Stand up in the name of Jesus. How many times did Jesus pass back by that man at the temple? How many times could Jesus have had an opportunity to heal him? I mean, these are great questions. Why didn't Jesus just heal everyone around him? Uh, anybody got any, any, any other thoughts that they want to add and contribute to this? Feel welcome to jump in, by the way. Go for it, Cam. Well, he does say according to your faith. Um, that doesn't count if you're dead, though. It's true. Then, it's our, then it's our faith. Mm. Um, but um, I, I remember there's a, a guy who's a director of um, um, John G. Lake Ministries, and he is really, he has some amazing stories of what happens, but I, he was, I remember one, he was going to visit someone in the hospital, pray for them, and the ladies behind the counter were talking about their arthritis, and he said, oh, let me pray for you. This was a, a regular thing, and, and um, they said, what for? And they basically said, well, we don't believe in it. He said, well, you don't have to believe in it. And so they had zero faith, and he still healed, still healed their arthritis on the spot, where they were just flabbergasted. So um, it's, uh, yeah, God's big. Amazing, Cam. That's that's absolutely amazing. Peter, you wanted to say something there? Yeah, I know um, some people talk about, well, everyone ends up um, passing away from something. Is is this scripture saying that the only way that some people should pass away is due to old age uh, and no sickness? Because if they're not to have any sickness or pass away from sickness or things like that, um, de you know, we're all appointed once to die and it's uh it might be a point to add to the discussion there as well i like i like your questions peter these are these are slightly we would call those disruptor questions they, that's great um i think jay you were going to say something next on that one well um i did have something to say but um kind of answering peter's question we know that the, these are blessings for obeying god's torah and currently in the world and I, like no one that I know is perfect at obeying God's word. We know that in the messianic era, everyone will know God's word. It will be written on everyone's heart. We also know that during that time, there will be no sickness. So there is almost like a link there that we haven't, we're not fully obeying God's word because we're not able to at the moment, we're trying it the best that we can, but there still is sickness. So in a way that promise can't be fully fulfilled. We can see, um, we can see it being partially fulfilled, but like, I guess globally and that there'll be absolutely no sickness is something that will happen in the messianic era. Mm -hmm. And going back on what G um, Jesus and healing um, people and not healing certain people, when we see Jesus healing everyone, it was everyone that came to him. And so I guess there was ov obviously people who didn't come to him who probably didn't get healed. Um, yeah. Anyway. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Um, Pastor Lynn, uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment that, um, that the Lord knew that there would be sickness um, after Jesus went to be the right hand of the Father. And he provided, and one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit is the gifts of healings. And so, uh, you know, that's something that every believer filled with the Holy Spirit is perhaps responsible for. Um, and part of our ministry, um, you know, some people just have an amazing gift of healings. So God knew there still would be sickness, you know, but he provided for it mm. in the power of the Holy Ghost. That's, That's right. all. Yeah. That's right. No, thank you, Pastor Lynn. Um, what we'll have is we'll have uh, Glennis uh, or John and Glennis and then April. Uh... Um, yeah. Is it just, is it a matter of God's timing? It's another good question, isn't it, Glennis? <laughs> what is your thought, Glennis? Do you think it's a matter of God's timing? What What does that look um, like? I think it is in one way, yeah. Um, yeah, because it's up to him, isn't it? It's in his timing. Maybe we've got to learn lessons 
do things? I don't know. My two bobs worth is, isn't all miracles done for the glory of God? Yep. They need to know why the miracle was done in the first place. Very good. Very good, John. Thank you. Thank you for those thoughts. I, I, I think, April, you look like you were going to echo something maybe Glennis was saying there. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, all parts are totally valid um, uh, points of view. And I think something that I was drawn to is thinking about, like, um, when Jacob, Jacob, oh, um, walked with the lip. It was Jacob, wasn't it? He walked with the lip? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and so... Um, you know, that was something that he had to bear because of an experience that he had that was a reminder of those things. And it reminds me of, like, the Israelites. Um, it wasn't sickness as such, but it was a heart condition, which is kind of a sick heart anyway, of why they were stuck in the wilderness is they couldn't let go of that sort of trauma and that um, experience, if you will. And so it makes me think also that, like, we don't know the fullness and magnitude of God, but he also uses us as vessels to bring his glory about to the world. And yep. so when he allows or he doesn't heal in certain areas, it lets us be relatable to other people in the world. So that way they know and can hold on to God and meet with him. And it brings that opportunity for others to come to him. Mm. I love those thoughts, April. I really, really, really do. And and I'm gauging just from the room's responses that none of us are disagreeing that we, we, uh, we or at least we agree that we think that everybody can be healed for the glory of God. I, I think that's the sentiment I'm picking up. Tony's just written something uh, in the chat. She says, I've seen a lot of folk healed who are not Christians and they had no faith for it. Many Christians use the wording according to your faith as a, as a blame on the person they're praying for for not being healed. That's a very good point, Tony. Uh, sometimes we see people, you know, we, we who are humans, we try and justify a lack of healing uh, by saying, well, that person mustn't have had enough faith or they mustn't have done this or they mustn't have done that. You know, I, I think it's very important for us to be considerate and consider the voice of the Holy Spirit when it comes to laying hands on people. And to follow his leading. We know his words say that that it is it is his will that they're healed. We're to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But at the same time, I, I wouldn't necessarily go condemning someone on their lack of faith unless there are two things, possibly a relationship with that person in some way or uh, the word of God encouraging them to rise up in faith. That's probably just a gentle encouragement. Kelly, you've got something to add to that? Yeah, I, I think, oh, sorry, I just about wipe the iPad out. I think the other thing I just want to say um, in conjunction with that is if you are not healed straight away or it becomes a process of time, will you still love the Lord despite that? Will yes. you still stay faithful to the Lord? Will you continue to keep his commands, follow in his steps and be faithful despite what happens? So, and I think that's the first and foremost. Yes, he does heal. There's no doubt about it. But will you still be faithful? Absolutely, him? absolutely. Kelly, thank you for that. That uh, there. Oh, uh, we also have Margaret. Do you want to go for it, Margaret? Yes, with the man with the pool of Siloam, I believe Jesus used to go and pray for the Father. He only did what the Father said and what the Father showed him. And I believe the Father would show him, when you get the spiritual world, you're not bound by time. Father would show him what did he want to do the next day, and then he would just do what the Father showed him, what the Father did. So with that, but also with healing, doubt and unbelief cancel faith. Uh, also, unforgiveness, bitterness, you know, occult involvement, free much. There's many things that block faith, but it needs the person themselves who's sick may not have the faith, but it needs someone has to have it. So it may be the one with the gift of healings or something. He has a rima revelation, faith, you know, word. It, someone needs the faith. It doesn't necessarily mean the person who's sick. Everything in the spiritual is activated by faith, and there's rima revelation, faith. I think of need with healing. That's wonderful. Margaret, thank you for adding that. I, I love that that was just added in so quickly and succinctly. Thank you for, for, for saying that. And you're right. Jesus says he didn't do anything that he didn't see the Father do, and he didn't say anything that he didn't uh, hear the Father 
uh, say as well. So that's important. So let's let's go along here. We're going to talk about sickness for a little bit because there's a few uh, points I want to raise. So we must treat sickness according to this scripture in Deuteronomy as an unwelcome person at our home. I, I, I don't know what it looks like for you at nighttime, but if I'm having a private dinner with my family and someone six nights or seven nights of the week knocks on my door at nighttime and demands my attention and you must meet with me now. I'm having dinner with my family. You know, I'm sorry. I'm not going to, I'm not going to see that person who's knocking on the door and demanding, you know, time and time and time and time and time all, all while I'm just trying to get some time with my, my family. That's what an unwelcome person at our home would be like. And that's what sickness should be like to us in the, in our response. We should be able to say to that unwelcome person, I'm sorry, but you're not welcome here mm. at this time or ever. Sickness, cancer, disease, tumors, uh, headaches, migraines, whatever it is, you are not welcome here. This is my house. This house belongs to the Lord. And you might try and come in, but the door is closed to you. So a question that we need to ask then is, well, does sickness come only as a result of sin? And this is where I think, uh, Peter, you might have been heading with one of your questions earlier. Uh, does sickness only come as a result of sin? At no, least from this passage, it looks believe. like it possibly could. It looks like it possibly could, but I think we need to investigate. Uh, we could conclude from this passage that it comes on only those who are sinful or possibly those who've had sinful parents because what we talked about earlier, the Torah cycle, success, complacency, neglect, and failure. However, we read a slightly different reason for sickness that's present in John 9. And before we go there, we need to establish a baseline for what this passage really is. Um, disease, according to Deuteronomy 7.15, which is what we're reading now, are described as the diseases of Egypt. And these diseases include, but are not limited to the 10 plagues. So I'm going to read, we know the 10 plagues, but there are a couple of other diseases. So the 10 plagues are the water turning to blood, uh, frogs, lice, flies, livestock, pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and the killing of the firstborn. However, the other common diseases of ancient Egypt that are recorded through history include, uh, and this is sort of historical finding, findings have discovered, this is kidney stones. So a big one was kidney stones, bacterial infections, cancer or malignant disease, gout, leprosy, infantile paralysis, and appendicitis were all very, very common uh, including blood clots, were all very, very common in ancient Egypt. And so when the scripture says that the diseases of Egypt uh, will not come upon you, this is not just a reference to the plagues of Egypt, but the common diseases of Egypt that I've just read out there, um, which to me is pretty amazing if you think about it, because God's covering off a bunch of diseases that shall not touch a person who is connected to the covenant. And if you didn't catch that, cancer was one of those things that was considered a plague or a disease of Egypt. If we have people in our community who have got who have expressed they've got cancers, it's an unwelcome person. If someone's got blood clots, it's an unwelcome thing. If they've got kidney stones, an unwelcome thing. So basically, any disease where there's a harmful deviation from the plan and the instruction that God gave our bodies, the normal structure, that is a sickness or disease that's not meant to be there. God gave us his Torah for us to live according to his ways and his instructions. He also gave a form of Torah to our bodies. It's called our DNA. He created the perfect blueprint. And as long as we're following the commands of God, we also find that our bodies should then be in step with uh, its blueprint, God's blueprint for us. However, there are two ways in which this DNA or problems can occur in our body. So the first, which we've discussed from Deuteronomy 7.15, is disobedience to the word of God. A person can inherit sickness or disease by being constantly in disregard for the word of God. That's what Deuteronomy 7.15 tells us. And the second reason why a person might be sick, does anybody know the second reason why a person might be sick? It's been bandied around a couple of times this morning. What is the second reason that a person might be sick according to scripture? So that God can get what? The glory. That's right. Thank you, Michelle. So John 9 verses 1 to 7. I'm just going to read this out quickly. As he passed by, 
Jesus saw a man blind by birth, John 9, 1 to 7. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man's or the parents? Now, can you see that according to Deuteronomy 7, 15, this is a perfectly logical question? Who sinned? Deuteronomy 7.15 tells us that Torah disobedience begets sickness. Who sinned? This man or the man's parents? And Jesus answered, It was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for night is coming where no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spit on the ground. He made mud with saliva and he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which meant sent. And he went and he washed back and he came back seeing. Now, for those of you who've seen that story before and thought Jesus was an absolute genius to spit in mud, you know, maybe he was a potter and whatever he was doing. This was a fairly common approach to eye uh, diseases where mud and saliva would be applied. Jesus was taking something natural, applying it, but he had the foresight that he had the word of God, that the father was going to heal this man. And that's what's important in this story is that he had heard God say that he was going to heal this man for the glory of God. So sickness and disease can be a result of sin. And it's always good when we're facing a person who is sick uh, or in pain to get them to reflect on whether there has been sin, uh, especially with believers if there has been ongoing sin or an area of hidden sin and whether or not that person is cons consistently walking in it without repentance, that can attract sickness to a person. Or in contrast, as according to John 9, we see that sickness can there be utilized for God's glory. So we see the two ways that sickness can be upon a person. And the conclusion is regardless how sick a person is, how full of disease a person is, how apparent their pain might be, God desires sickness to be gone. A person's body can be rid of pain, rid of sickness, rid of disease, according to this covenant that we're talking about today. It is absolutely God's will that you are healed in your body. Absolutely God's will. Earlier this week, I uh, went and had an x-ray on my foot. I, I shared with a couple of you that I'd been in uh, pain on the weekend, had a word of knowledge and it did reduce in pain, but I was still feeling some level of pain. And the uh, x-ray revealed that there was a benign tumor in my right foot. And the benign tumor was pushing against the nerves, which was causing my uh, pain. And I, I think at last weekend, I was about a nine out of 10 level of pain. And I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, this is either something I need to sort out in my life. There's either a problem here if, if I'm feeling pain in my body or it's going to be that you get the glory. And I believe that the Lord will get the glory from any sickness that you have had in your body. Let the Lord get the glory and let there be a testimony of his goodness. That's the only reason sickness should ever be in and around our body. Uh, Kelly, did you have a question? Or statement? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to, um, I'm sure probably people have thought this, is what about, um, you know, people that are born with um, a sickness of sort? Are they, you know, I just thought I'd ask that question. That I'm sure people thought that or wonder that too. Great question, Kelly. Thank you for that. Does anybody, would anybody like to jump in on that one? Would any of our, our teaching team like to have a response there or a thought? Peter, go for it. Yeah, I've had obviously similar thoughts in the past, but uh, thinking about um, the fall of Adam and Eve and how sin entered the world, there's a there are our sins which we commit that can affect um, our health, but uh, potentially the the fall of mankind and we see genetic mutations and people born with um, a chromosome that's slightly off that can cause uh, different um, maybe uh, conditions or things like that. We may see people with that. It doesn't limit God. God, God can correct anything. He can restore anything. And uh, I believe that, you know, through faith, he can heal even those things and correct those mm -hmm. things. Um, but there are people that, 
may still continue to live with that. And uh, yeah, it, it does, you know, that might not answer every the question you're asking directly, but uh, um, maybe that helps. Thank you, Peter. Kelly, you wanted to respond to that one? Well, Ezekiel 18 talks about the sins of the father too. Well, no, Ezekiel 18, yeah. And is that the same kind of sin that we're talking about here? You know, like when we're talking sin, we're talking sin. And I'm not saying that it passes on, but of course it comes down to repentance as well. Is that got play with it there or? Yeah, Probably absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. No, no, it's not a spanner. It's great for discussion. Um, and, and, you know, there's there's a, a big conversation here that we could have a, a, and part of it I'll sideline, but part of the conversation to sideline is how uh, how now that we have faith in Jesus, where do the curses of the law uh, sit in, in relation to a believer? And some of those include ongoing generational uh, sickness and sin. However, to respond to that, uh, John 9 was stated that this man was sick from birth and that he did and it was neither that his own sin or the sins of his father that uh, that caused him to be in this state. And so uh, all I can conclude there is that for some people, they may be born in a certain way, but God can and God will get the glory, whether it's through a, a delivering of that person from sickness and disease immediately or whether it's through the person living a life dedicated to the Lord. There are many ways which the Lord will der derive glory, but I can tell you wholeheartedly from myself that I believe it is God's will that they are to be healed. Michelle? Right. What he's saying in um, John 9 is this. What happens when a child is, is diagnosed with a condition that is probably hereditary or comes down generationally? the parents start blaming one another here. You know, it's from your side of the family or it's from your side of the family. Having a personal, uh, um, uh, this, this happened personally. And it, so and so one, one partner blames the other partner for the child's um, condition. But here it is, um, but when you talk about sickness and disease, not everything that a, a person gains or is born with is actually sickness or disease. It's actually a condition it can be. And um, it's in the end, when you have a child that has a condition that's not that's not causing sickness, but it's it's like, you know, you talk about uh, Down syndrome and things like that, then, then it's to the glory of God that that child lives longer than what's been predicted, that any health issue can be addressed through the name of Jesus and the power of his word. And um, to, in the end, it brings glory to the Lord because they, not everybody needs um, healing in this case because they're actually not sick. They've got a condition they were born with or they've acquired and then they need a miracle. So sometimes we're praying for things that are um, like for healing when in fact that person actually needs a miracle. In other words, to change the course of nature. And it's the same when somebody is, has a disease and it can lead to their destruction or their physical demise, you actually have to ask the Lord to actually change, change that course in nature, which normally would happen, and interrupt that sickness through the power of his word and healing. Thank you, Michelle. That's that's absolutely wonderful. And, you know, I, I had a, a, a lady who had type 2 uh, diabetes uh, say at one church service, she said, why, why is it always people with the... The, the, the obvious physical pain that get healed and, and never never me. And uh, and I said, look, we just need to believe and have faith. And this is what I think Jen, was it Jen Belshaw or someone commenting on Jen, something Jen said is, we need to have faith to believe that the God of heaven and earth who can create a human being and a universe with just so much as a thought can also do the incredible re rewiring, the, the, uh, the, composure or recomposure of a human being from scratch. He can bring it all together to restore a person, whether it's a visibly physical ailment, something internal, whether it's something a person is born with, not necessarily a disease or sickness. God can do it all and he can do it for his uh, for His glory. Is everyone, everyone okay on that point? 
Fantastic. All right. I, I would love to, uh, I'm sure we've all got a testimony of healing and I want to uh, call on those in just a moment, but I want to go to the next verse where God raises up a righteous standard. So we're moving now where he's talked about, there'll be no sterile or barren, no sick among you. And in verse 16 of chapter seven, it says this, and you shall consume all the peoples which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not spare them, nor shall you worship their gods, for that will be a snare to you. So God promises as they're about to go, the people of Israel are about to go into the land and he promises that they're going to overcome and consume the seven nations of the land of Canaan and that they're not to fear them. The conditions of this promise are twofold. That, they shall not, uh, that the nations themselves shall not be spared. And secondly, that their gods are not to be worshipped. So recapping that, they must utterly destroy the seven nations and that the gods must be utterly uh, destroyed and not worshipped. So who knows what the seven nations inside the land of Israel were? Can anyone tell me those? Any of our studious people on here today tell us? I'm looking at Finn and Chloe and Lily. Maybe even Pauline has a couple of those. Who knows? Any of the nations, shout them out. Just to unmute yourself and shout them out as you go. Canaanites. Canaanites. Gergeshites or are they one? Maybe? Uh, well, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, Hittites? Hittite? Yeah. Jebusites. Amalekites. Jebusites is one of them. Yep. Parasites. <laughs> They're all coming to that, Ben. <laughs> all the ites. All the ites. The ites. We've got the Canaanites. Who are the Amorites? That's right. The Gershagites. The Ger the it's a good yes. one. That'd be a tongue twister, won't The Gergeshites. The the yeah, that's right. Canaanites. The Canaanites. The Hivites. Yep. The Jebusites. The Perizzites. And the Parasites. No, just the Paras Perizzites. So. <laughs> Question for you, why after naming those seven nations, does the Lord refer to the land by the name Canaan? Why, why does he call it the name of one of the tribes? Not, uh, you know, I don't know. Why didn't he call it the land of the Perizzites or the Jebusites? Why the land of Canaan? Who's, who, who can tell me a thought on why it might have been called that rather than any one of the other six nations there? Was it because Canaan lived there? First, you know, Cain. Canaan, yes, very, very good thought. Yeah, Canaan, um, being the descendant of Noah, yes, he, he was, he was there. He would have been there first. Yes, Beth. I was going to say it. I think it was the descendant of Noah. Yes, perfect. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're spot on there. Dean, did you want to add anything there? I know Beth said well, I was um, descendant of. Noah's son, um, child, Canaan. Yep, fantastic. All right, and Bill Shores. Were all the other nations sons of Canaan? Sorry. Were the other nations all sons of Canaan? Spot on there, Chloe. Spot on. That is one of the theories as why it was called uh, Canaan. Is that those are, uh, those other nations were descendants of the land of Canaan. But can anyone, and I'll probably look to the bell shores, even Finn. Finn, do you know what the word Canaan means in Hebrew by any chance? Does anyone know what the word Canaan means in Hebrew? Uh, you know, in a room like this, I feel like there's a chance that someone might know. But but that's all right. The, I'll give you a second. And if not, that's okay. I've, I do have the answer to this one. Abby's thinking. I can see the light bulb ticking above her head. All right. So the word Canaan. So this is another theory. The word Canaan means merchant. And uh, all seven nations were known as trader nations, merchant nations in the land. And Israel was known as being a very uh, full land. Obviously, when the spies came back and looked at the land, there were grapes and milk flowing, you know, honey. So it's plausible that these were called the land of Canaan, being the land of merchants or the land of traders, uh, as well as being the descendants of Canaan. And so when uh, when the people of Israel go in, they knew that this was the land of the Canaanim or the, or the merchants or the sons of Canaan. So when question, another question, when might the time have been ripe or right for Israel to enter the land of Israel? Who knows when it was the right time to go into the land? 
And now a very easy answer could be say, when God said, that's not the answer I'm looking for this morning. <laughs> when was the right time? Beth or Leon? Um, was it, in fact, the time when they sent the spies in? They should have just gone in themselves. It's very, very true. They should, they should have, and by faith, they should have gone there. Jen, you've got something to add to that? I think I recall it was when the sin of the Am Amorites or the Amalekites were right. That's right. That's right. Genesis 15, uh, 16, Jen's calling upon there, and it says, In the fourth generations of your descendants, we will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. The sin of the people of the land uh, needs to have reached its critical point. And so there's there's a, a, a really interesting point is that the sin and wickedness of, of Israel, or sorry, the land of Canaan, had to reach a climax so that the people could go in. When the wickedness of the world reaches up a point, God intervenes and raises up a standard. Does anybody think the wickedness of the world around us is at a certain point where we need to see a standard being raised? Getting I think close. So. We're getting pretty close, aren't we? We need a standard being raised, and that standard needs to be of righteousness. So in Genesis 6, there was great evil in the world, and we see that God raised a standard through Noah. In uh, Genesis 19, we see the sin and wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah so great, God raises up a standard through Abraham and some standard through Lot, and there was destruction and judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 15, the sin of the Amorites, fourth generation, and then Matthew 24 says, at the time of Messiah, the coming of Messiah, it will be as what? As uh, in comparison to what? What will it be like in the time just preceding Messiah? Go for it. Sodom and Gomorrah. You like Sodom and Gomorrah? Or Noah. No, times of Noah. No. Times of Noah. That's right. It will be just as in the times of Noah. And so when wickedness, folks, is exalted in the world, God intervenes, raises up a standard. And you know that Torah cycle that we talked about at the start? The Torah, success, uh, complacency, neglect, and then failure. God rises up a standard. And as that standard increases, people come back to the Torah once again. Some view this as a swinging of cultural conservatism, but this is not just cultural conservatism. This is this is set by godly people choosing to live according to godly standards. That's how the cycle resets. We want the world to be blessed. We need to see people discipled in the ways of God. Matthew 7, 13, uh, Leanne, are you there, Leanne? Yes, Leanne, could you please read for me Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14? Matthew 7, 13 to 14. While she's uh, getting that one, I'm just going to ask uh, if, uh, Kelly, you could please grab Genesis 3, verses 1 to 7. And, Abby, could you please grab 1 Corinthians 3, verses 18 to 20. Have you got that one, Leanne? Ready? Yep. Yeah, Sorry. ready when you are. Um, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Thank you, Leanne. So this, this scripture here is very important to God raising up the righteous standard. And, you know, we talk about coming to faith in Jesus as being a very wonderful, open, acceptable thing. And it is the hope that we have in Jesus is broad. The hope that we have in Jesus should be shared for the whole world. It's a light to the nations kind of event that we have the Messiah, faith in Messiah who can resurrect our bodies. Our broken bodies can be resurrected, healed, etc. But he's also the narrow gate. So once we find him, he then sets the parameters of how we're to live. We enter through the narrow gate and that brings us into the foyer of true life. Once we're in the foyer, we have the option to dwell in that foyer forever in just our faith in Jesus. Or he points forward a path that leads to continual life. And this is where in verse 14, it says the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Is the way going to be completely easy? No, it's going to be hard. 
And the reality is it's there for those who want to find it. It's a hard road because it's lost often in distractions, mistruths, misunderstandings and complacency, and especially this one, worldly wisdom. These are all enemies of the narrow road, mistruths, distractions, misunderstandings, complacency and worldly wisdom. But the reality is the hard road is there for those who choose to find it and desire it. And you will bear the fruit if you find it. So let's go to verse 17 of Deuteronomy 7. It says in Deuteronomy 7, uh, 17, Will you say to yourself that these nations are more numerous than I? How will I be able to drive them out? You shall not fear them. You shall surely remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. So here Moses is giving a bit of a warning. And he's saying to them, you might have this question that says, because there are so many of them, how are we actually going to achieve this? Rashi says here that, that the, uh, the word here is perhaps, it's, it's, it's like it creates doubt. Perhaps we might say to ourselves, you know, maybe they're too big for us. Logically, they're too big for us. There are so many enemies. How are we going to even uh, deal with them? And the question comes to mind of, did God really say? This is one of the most asked questions of all time. Did God really say? And this can range from, range from our calling, our destiny, our purpose, uh, church communities, jobs and spouses. Did God really say I was going to marry that person? Did God really say that I should leave this church and go to another church? You know, the question of did God really say is such a big one. And in fact, on the other side, we get people saying God said probably a bit too much. God's speaking to me. God's saying this. And we end up mis, uh, betraying the fact that God may not have spoken at all. But did God really say is the great question that Lucifer raised to Eve in the garden when God had already told Adam and Eve to obey his instructions absolutely clearly. God told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And did God really say was the question that Lucifer posed to Eve. Is that what he really meant? Do you think it would still be okay? Just cast enough doubt in there and let the answer, you know, perhaps God didn't really mean you could, you know, not eat all of it. Maybe you could just have a bite. I don't know. Doubt. A little confusion amidst the command goes a long way. Truth, if it is nine parts or a, a word, if it is nine parts truth and one parts lie, is still a mistruth. Deception, unbelief, mistrust, lies can all be welcomed as intentional and logical. But as long as they carry a hint of disobedience, they're indeed wrong. So God's direct instruction in Genesis 2.17 was this. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. Direct. It was succinct. Succinct. It was clear. Clear KPI. You know, if this is a job role description, it was clear. Eat of everything. Don't eat of that. Yes, you got it. Yes, Lord, we got it. Crystal. Clear. Done. Don't eat of it. Is it fruit? Yes. Could it taste all right? Yes. But all the relevant questions, as much of our intention and logic don't matter here because God had said, don't eat of it. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? It might have been nourishing for the soul. It could have been delicious to look upon, but all uh, completely uh, not relevant as long as God said, don't touch it. So what happens next, and Kelly's going to read this in just a moment, is shocking, but a warning, warning to those of us who choose to see the commands of God and then act according to our flesh, not what, not in line with what the Spirit of God and the Scriptures are saying. Over to you, Kelly. Genesis 3, 1 to 7. Yep, no worries. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. 
Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig trees to leaves together. I said big trees, that's a bit big. Big leaves <laughs> together and made themselves loincloths. <laughs> that's great. Thank, thanks for that. I'm glad, yeah, glad they got those fig trees sorted out, Kel. <laughs> um, you see here, Lucifer poses some interesting statements and they're in direct contradiction to God. Uh, the command that God had given, God had stated, do not eat of it. If you eat of it, you're surely going to die. And so Adam and Eve had never experienced death. So Lucifer's counter argument would have seemed exceptional um, to someone who didn't know what death was. His argument would have seemed deceptively wonderful. You know, how enticing is it that we can be wise or even like God? Why not? A person might ask. Why not? The, the idea of receiving, you know, bountiful amounts of wisdom sounds really good. The idea of having my eyes open sounds really good. Uh, and being like God and knowing good or evil, that sounds just fantastic. Sign me up. Put, you know, this infomercial's great, Lucifer. Thank you. I, in fact, I will eat of that fruit. Give me two. And uh, and so and so, this is how Satan does things. First Corinthians three eighteen. Abby, you got that one? Thank you, Abby. Three eighteen to where? Sorry. Uh, Twenty, if that's all right. Sure. Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think that you are wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God, as the scriptures say. He traps the wise in the snares of their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows that they are worthless. All right. So thank you, Abby, for sharing that one. So the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise and their foolishness or futile to him. And let no one deceive himself thinking he is wise. In other words, really, folks, what we're talking about here is when God sets some parameters of commands for us to follow, he cares not for our best intentions, nor for our goodwill, nor for our own way that we can circumnavigate the commands. What he's asking for is our obedience. This is, this is, this is the prime point today, is that when God sets his standard, it's good for us to follow his blueprint is good for us to follow and anything else leads to death. This, this is a warning as clear as time itself is that the person thinks himself wise or can circumnavigate the commands of the Lord. That person is actually foolish. And this is where faith comes in. Faith is vitally important in your journey of obeying the commands of God here because it requires that we have faith to fulfill what God asks us, even if it seems silly. Uh, we will be blessed. I mean, imagine how Abraham would have felt in Genesis 22, as God has said, I want you to go and take your son, the promised son, Isaac, the one who, you know, all the, all the, the generations are going to be as numerous as the sands and the stars. He, you're not going to take him, Abraham. You're going to go to that mountain and you're going to sacrifice him on top of it. Can you imagine the reason he probably didn't want to tell Sarah? I mean, I, I'm just imagining he probably thought, my wife's either going to fully support me in this. I hope I catch her on a really on a day she's full of faith, or there will be no sacrifice. I Abraham will be the sacrifice. You know, have you ever tried to stand between a woman and a son? Don't do it, folks. And so Abraham heads off towards that. And can you imagine that journey? How long that journey would have been, as faith and doubt would have been going between his head and his heart, and just cycling like this. And the questions he might have said was, "Didn't you say that my lineage was going to be forever?" Didn't you say that the lineage was going to be blessed through the promised son? What if I just pretend to sacrifice Isaac? Lord, maybe I'll get to the base of the mountain and that will be enough. And it could have been here that Abraham pulled some arguments with, with the Lord and said, Lord, I know maybe you're testing me uh, and it's enough. But rather, Abraham followed God's command exactly. And it was his faith in God's command that brought about the true result. And, and Isaac was spared. It was his obedience and faith that led to be there being the nation of Israel, the exalted and promised Messiah, uh, the grafting of the Gentiles, the kingdom and the resurrection life. So this comes because a man had faith beyond what he thought in his intention and logic might be doable. So has anyone heard of uh, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law? Anyone heard of that before? The letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. Okay, let's talk about that for a couple of minutes. I know we've got nine minutes before we finish this. Paul talks about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law in 2 Corinthians 3 verses 4 to 6. I'm going to read this out just for time. 
And the reason we're looking at this is because this is a, a great misunderstanding. Um, I, I, maybe you've heard people talk about the letter of the law being what's written in the scripture and the spirit of the law being the possible intention behind it. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 4 to 6, such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Many would argue that since the coming of Jesus and since we have faith, it's no longer necessarily necessary to follow the commands of the law, uh, which is the constitution of the kingdom or the Torah, but rather just to listen to the spirit of God. And it's at this point, I think we need to take note of two things. So he here would have said that they believe that the spirit of the law is the intention of of the law who, who would have said that the spirit of the law is the intention or the heart behind it right who would have thought that fantastic all right well let's let's talk about that um so two things we need to comment on and this is so we understand deuteronomy 7 folks this is why we're looking at second corinthians so the first thing we need to take heed of is did god really say so did god really say the words that he used to Eve in the garden, did God really say? Could, is it possible for God to really cancel his own commands when he's already stated that they will be there until day and night cease? Does this sound like a God statement or does this sound like through our understanding maybe a Lucifer statement of did God really say? The second thing we must heed is that in 2 Peter 3 verses 16, Peter, who's the chief of the apostles, he says, as he does in all of his letters, referring to Paul, when he speaks in, in them in these matters, there are some things in them which are difficult or hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. So addressing the first point, God's already said that his law, his commands, his Torah endures forever, at least until day or night cease, and that Jew or Gentile follow those according to their calling. Uh, men have commands, women have commands, Jews have commands, uh, Gentiles have commands. And it leads to life, but disobedience leads to death. And then the second point about the uh, scripture from Peter is that he states that Paul's writings are difficult to understand, that the ignorant, unstable, and lawless in many translations twist to their own destruction. So for you watching today, we don't want to be confused by Satan on what God really said. And secondly, we must know that Paul's letters are difficult to understand, that the ignorant and lawless will use it to their own destruction. So let's keep going. Corinthians 3 verse 4 to 6. When Paul refers to the letter to kill that kills and the spirit that brings life, he isn't referring to our interpretation of how the commands might make sense. He's not, re he's not referring to how we speak when we say the spirit of things, you know, in the spirit of something. He's not referring to that. For example, when God commands his people to not eat pig because it's an abomination, many people have looked at the science. They've looked at God's reasoning. They, they think now that it's because there are healthier standards of meat processing, disease control, uh, pork being the leanest meat, that now it's acceptable to eat pig. Has anyone heard those arguments before? You might have heard those arguments before. Yes, that is an example of misusing the spirit of the law. God never gave it a, a permission. God never gave it a, a permission for us to circumnavigate the command by applying our own logic to the command. So, so therefore, the spirit of the law must be something else. Paul is using the word letter of the law here to indicate what he's already revealed over and over. And that is that the Torah will lead people to eventually disobedience and sin and eventually death for the wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So therefore, when Paul says the letter kills, he's correct. The Torah will condemn to sin and disobedience. Absolutely. Because all have sinned and would have no hope for resurrection. The letter of the law or the letter of the Torah does kill. In contrast, though, we have the spirit of the law, which we pick up in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, which is accessible. We have resurrection and hope through Jesus. Now, you all know this, 
that comes through faith in Messiah. Romans 6.23 says that the free gift of God is eternal life, uh, resurrection. Jeremiah 31, which is the new covenant, the verses 34 says the promise of the new covenant that I will forgive their iniquity and I, their sin, I will remember it no more. And I will write their Torah on my hearts. So therefore, rather than viewing the letter of the law and the spirit of the law as two opposing forces, we need to see it like this. One does not supersede the other. There is one Torah, one standard, but where the letter of the law led people to a conviction and condemnation of eternal death. Now through faith in Messiah and the Holy Spirit, we have hope of resurrection. The Spirit exists to those who have faith in Jesus as a continuous hope to live in and towards holiness through resurrection. So when a person comes to faith in Jesus, it's not the Torah that leads them to life. It's faith in Jesus that leads them to life. And the spirit of the law will then walk them continually to the end of their days in a life of holiness. Are you picking up what I'm saying? A person without hope, without Jesus, the letter of the law kills them. A person who finds hope and has Jesus, the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the commands of the Lord will find a life of holiness. Is everyone okay? All right. Fantastic. Folks, we're just about at time. Uh, and there are some amazing things I wish I could have got onto today. <laughs> but I will just just do a quick... Uh, who's read this portion already? Fantastic. Any questions just in the last couple of minutes on the letter of the law and the spirit of the law? I don't want to skip over that, but I know we've just got a couple of minutes. Anyone got any questions on that one? All right. I'm going to share my screen with you just for a quick moment. Here we go. Can you all see that? All right. I've got a couple of questions for you. I'm going to have to skip over this part here. Okay. Now, we didn't cover this today, but I'm hoping there's someone who might be studious enough uh, in the group having read the portion to know what this is. All right. So who knows what the Tzira R is? I'm looking at the Belshaws. Belshaws, do you know what the Tzira R is? Does anybody know what that one is? Now, it's mentioned a little bit further in Deuteronomy uh, 7, but it is, and does anybody, Michelle, do you know? Absolutely. Is it the Hornet? It's the Hornet. Is that Scott? Fantastic. It's the Hornet. Yes, you're correct. It's an insect. Although it's very possible that this insect is a, uh, a spiritual insect as well. It causes blindness and impotence in those in the land of Canaan. So as the uh, Israelites were going in, it said God would send the hornet with them. This hornet causes great confusion. And uh, it, you remember the story of Gideon and the Midianites. Gideon goes in with 300 men. And we don't see any presence or talk of the physical hornet, but we do see that confusion starts to follow them. All right, last question. How often did the man or manna fall in the desert? Once a day. Once a day. All right, Leon's got it. All right, we'll do one more there. Uh, let's go on to... Okay, why did God give the land of Canaan to the Jewish people? Because he'd promised it to their forefathers, because the Jews were righteous people, or because the nations who lived in the land were wicked? What's the answer there? I. Yes? Any others? I, yeah. I think it's all of them. It's, John, you're very close. It's A and C because he had promised it to their forefathers because the nations who lived in the uh, land of Israel were wicked. All right, folks, we're at 11 o'clock, so I'm going to have to uh, shut us off there, but would love to thank you very, very much for being on and joining with us today. Well, May the Lord days. bless the rest of your day. Shabbat shalom. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Okay. Thank God you. Bless. Bye. Bye. Bye.